Welcome everyone to this fourth in the education webinar series, Singapore Schools, hosted by me, John Milne, Head of Global Education at Henley & Partners. It's my great pleasure today to welcome Trevor Sturgeon, who is an associate of Henley & Partners, a very highly experienced educationalist based in Asia, and focusing in today on his area of expertise, and that is the competitive landscape in Singapore. So Trevor, welcome today to today's webinar. Thanks, John. It's a very simple format today. Trevor will be presenting for around 15 to 20 minutes, starting in a few moments. If you have any questions, please do enter them into the Q&A channel or the chat channel, and I'll be very happy to answer those as I go along. If I can't answer those, I'll direct them towards Trevor. There will be contact details at the end of the webinar should you wish to engage some more with either Henley & Partners Education or Trevor specifically. But in the meantime, I'm going to hand over to Trevor to delight us with his knowledge and his insight into Singaporean schools. Over to you, Trevor. Great, thank you very much, John. Um, nice to meet everyone virtually. Um, a little bit of background about myself and a little bit more detail. I'm Canadian, but I've spent the last 23 years working at international schools in Asia. Um, I worked at International School Manila, kind of the premier international school in the Philippines for 10 years. And I worked at Singapore American School for 13 years. Um, and my kids went through through school there. So I'm very familiar with the Singapore kind of landscape landscape of schools. And I know it's changed a lot or I've seen it changed a lot in the last 15 years, both in terms of the number of school options, but also more recently in terms of the competitiveness of schools. So as John mentioned, I'm gonna take about 15 minutes and kind of give you a brief overview of the Singapore school landscape. Um, I just want to reiterate, um, as John mentioned, please let us know your questions. Um, we know that we may not cover everything, but please shoot your questions our way during the presentation or at the end. So I guess the first thing to know, which is not surprising, there's kind of two options. There's a local Singapore schools, um, which generally are very sort of traditional in their sort of teaching methods, mostly the Singaporeans or Singaporean um, permanent residents. Um, really highly content driven, not a whole lot of sort of group work or sort of teacher and student kind of interaction. So really it's about kind of digesting the content. The other thing with the local Singapore system is they tend to track students very, very early. So there's a couple of tests that students do that early on and a little bit later that kind of determine their pathway. So you will see a lot of Singaporean students, you know, in tutoring centers or tuition centers, as I call them there on weekends, studying a lot because they know that how they perform very early in education kind of can determine their post-secondary options. The local system has six years of primary school, five years of secondary, and then students go on to either junior college and then university or a polytechnic um, college. I think what most of you are here for is to learn about international schools. And I put 40 plus options and it depends upon where you look, but there's somewhere between 40 and about 65 different international schools of all sort of shapes and sizes. The biggest um, differentiator, I guess, separate into sort of two groups. There's for-profit schools, um, and there's a lot of for-profit schools. So basically schools set up by businesses or private equity firms to, to make money. And then there's not-for-profit schools, of which there's only three. The other thing where there's a lot of variation is in the curriculum or the curricula of schools. Um, what sort of system um, or curricula they, they follow. And I'll talk more about that. But just to help you understand the differences between the for-profit and not-for-profit options. So as mentioned, the for-profit schools, they're owned typically by individuals, families, 
are more often private equity firms. Um, they tend to take profit off the top. So all the revenue coming in, all the tuition, they kind of take profit and then the school's left with the remainder for expenses. Um, the governance structure and the degree of power um, or autonomy that leadership at school has really varies um, a lot within this model. But generally speaking, compared to not-for-profit schools, um, they do get a mandate from their owners um, and they have a little bit less autonomy than maybe the not-for-profit schools. That said, the for-profit schools are not um, bad. There's a lot of variety in terms of the quality, the curricula, um, the autonomy of schools, the compensation for faculty, which is important. I'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit later. The not-for-profit schools, which in Singapore are classified under trusts, um, all the funds are reinvested. So no one owns the school. In fact, the community and the parents own the school and all have voting rights at the school when it comes for things like school leadership. So the board of trustees um, or the board that oversees the schools, the parents have a vote in terms of who, at most schools, in terms of who um, gets elected. So a large degree of independence. Now, having said that, as I mentioned, there's only three not-for-profit schools, and they tend to be the most competitive schools to get into in Singapore. Um, Singapore American School, again, United World College, and Tanglin Trust. Um, probably the most important part of this presentation are the family considerations in choosing a school. And I really want to emphasize that in choosing a school for your family and for your children, it's really about choosing the right fit school. And that's something that we help families with, with so many options. Um, it can be a lot of work to sort of sift through all the information and determine which school is the best fit. But some factors to consider, location, obviously, while Singapore is um, a small island. There are schools spread throughout almost the entire island from the north, east, west, and, and downtown. So location is a factor because you want to consider how far your kids have to commute, and that's especially important if you have younger students. You know, if you have students who are five or six years old, you probably don't, don't want them traveling 30 or 45 minutes on a bus each way every day. So location is a, is a factor. And oftentimes, as I mentioned, for younger, those families with younger kids, they might choose one school for elementary school and a different school for high school or middle school. Um, cost is worthwhile considering just within the international school sort of market in Singapore. Cost, fees, and tuition can range anywhere from about 20,000 Singapore dollars to close to 60,000 Singapore dollars. Another key thing to consider is the curriculum offered by the school. Um, and there's a large variety here as well. There's a few schools or a number of schools in Singapore that follow the international baccalaureate curriculum. There's a couple that follow the American Advanced Placement or AP program. Um, there's a number that follow um, the British um, curriculum and a bunch of other national systems or schools that borrow curriculums from other countries or, or provinces. So that ties a little bit into sort of post-secondary choices um, because depending upon what countries your child may be applying to for college or university, there may be one curriculum that might suit them a little bit better. Families often consider academic programs, academic quality, which of course is important, but we really encourage families to consider extracurricular and co-curricular programs as well. You know, what sports, arts, what activities does a school offer that may feed your child's passions or allow them to develop, to develop new passions? So it's a really important consideration, I think, for, for families because you know, a classroom is sort of a classroom, but what opportunities exist outside the classroom 
really enrich the students' experiences and can kind of think about post-secondary choices can um, you know, potentially help them in that college university search. Another thing are language options. You know, some families, you know, you may want your, if your child is a native Japanese speaker, you may want a school that has a strong Japanese program because you want them to con continue learning their native um, language. Um, but for second language programs, you may want your child to learn Spanish or Chinese. So different schools in Singapore have different language offerings and the quality of those offerings varies pretty substantially between different schools. The other thing related to language is, does a school have English as a second language support programs? So if your child is uh, a new English language learner, um, they probably will need um, an ESL support program. Some schools have very, very robust and strong ESL programs and other schools don't have them at all. Many schools will have ESL options that may be limited. So as an example, Singapore American School has ESL programs up until the end of elementary school, but doesn't have ESL support for middle school and high school. So if your child is entering eighth grade and is learning English, um, that may not be the best school for you. We have found, um, and I have found over 23 years of being in inter international schools, that a large degree of kind of family satisfaction about a school, obviously it has to do with student satisfaction, but also for parents, what opportunities exist for parents if they so choose to become involved in the school community. So whether it's parent teacher associations or different ways for parents to become involved, I think is important because parents who want to become involved feel more connected to the school if there are opportunities for them for them to be involved. Uh, faculty and student composition, I put these together, but really these could be separated. You want to look at where are the faculty from? Are they mostly Singaporean um, faculty, mostly British faculty, American? Or are they faculty from around the world? And what do you want for your students? Who do you want your students being educated by? Similarly, who do you want your students being surrounded by? Some families choose um, a school that is very similar to their their home country. So, uh, so they're surrounded by people from their home country because the parents really want them to develop those connections um, and that culture with people like them. Other families really want their students to be exposed to more, a greater diversity of students. So some schools in Singapore have upwards of 60 or 70 different nationalities in the school. Usually there's always one kind of dominant kind of group, um, whether it's, you know, Singapore American school, it tends to be mostly about 50% American, whereas Tanglin Trust typically or tends to be has a large percentage of, of British nationals. Um, you want, want to consider, I put age of students, but really what I sort of mean there are there, is it a school that serves students from kindergarten all the way through to the end of their secondary education or grade 12? Or is it a school that really is focused on one particular um, division? Is it just an elementary school? Very important are family values and thinking about what your family values are and how those line up with um, a school. So within Singapore and most countries, there's some very conservative, sometimes religiously um, connected schools. Um, and there's very, very liberal schools that are much more sort of open. So what are the values of the school and how do those sort of match up with your, with your family values? You know, I think back a little bit to my 23 years working overseas and it wasn't unusual for some first time 
um, families in international schools from relatively conservative backgrounds to be a little bit surprised that their kids were kind of a little bit more liberal than maybe they had hoped they would be. And that's sort of one trade-off with being an international school is kids are exposed to people from all around the world with different values and different beliefs. And finally, I would say the school culture. You know, what is a school culture? And that's very, very broad, but it can refer to how competitive or collaborative is a school? Um, is it a school where just that's just sort of active from eight in the morning until four in the afternoon? Or are there weekend events for the community? What, what is the vibe on campus? And finally, um, past success, um, whether that's exam results, college acceptances, university acceptances, what is the track record of the school in terms of helping and supporting students for the next stage of their educational journey, which for most students in most international schools means going off to college or university, um, which really was my, my role as a college counselor, um, working in international schools, really helping to guide students um, down that path to the next, on to college university. Um, so the general admissions process, I will say that the admissions process or processes at schools really varies quite a bit. So it's kind of hard to generalize. Um, you would think that it would be just as easy as sort of applying and hearing back, but it's really important to understand the process at each school in order to maximize chances of being admitted. In most cases, it's submitting an, an inquiry, hearing back from the school. Of course, visiting the school, both for yourself and for your children, is very, very helpful in terms of trying to figure out whether it's the best fit. Then submit an application and settle the application fee, which in most cases is non-refundable. Um, and this ties into making the best fit, really doing the research, um, or having us help you do the research. Because the application fee is non-refundable, you don't, probably don't wanna be applying to 10 different universities and paying between two and $5,000, which is just the application fee. Um, the school require a bunch of documents, which will vary depending upon the school, but it's important to have those documents verified in order and submitted on time to avoid delays. It's not unusual for families to forget to submit a document or not to submit the or to submit the incorrect document, which then cause delays in their application and potentially puts them at risk of losing a spot that may that may come up. Keep in mind too, you know, I mentioned from finding the best fit and making the best match for your family. Schools are looking for that as well. They're looking for students and families who are gonna be contributors, who are gonna add value. Um, but most schools are also looking to keep some different balance of diversity. So it can be more challenging sometimes for some families than others, depending upon background. Um, so it's really important to, for, for both you um, to consider best fit. Um, for use a family, but also where your where is your kid going to thrive the most? Some questions to ask, of course, what is the admissions process? I mentioned that it really does vary depending upon the school. Um, what is the priority system? So most schools in Singapore will have a priority system in terms of who they want to accept. So again, as an example, I'll use Singapore American School, their priority one families are American families. So if you're American, looking at Singapore American School, you're kind of to the front of the line. Their second priority are kids uh, whose parents work for American companies. And so they're priority two. And then there's about six other priority sort of classifications. 
but that priority system differs depending upon upon the school. Some schools will consider um, their priority system is based upon who they need. So if their target quota of, I don't know, let's say Korean students is 15% and they're only at 12%, then a Korean family would have higher priority. Is there a wait list? So most of the, of the most well-known schools in Singapore do have a wait list. Um, and if they do, what is the expected time from the time that you apply to typically when a family gets gets accepted. It's not on, at all unusual for a family to apply to a school, be put in the wait list, and in the meantime, have their child go to another school that may be less competitive to get into for a year or two before they get into their first choice school. The other thing to consider or to ask is, um, does the school support student visa applications? So a few schools in Singapore, if a family is not residing currently in Singapore uh, and their child does not have a student visa, Singapore student visa, then the student needs to apply for a student visa. And there are a few schools in Singapore that will support um, the student through that process because they do need um, confirmation from the school that they've been accepted. Um, the most competitive schools, UWC, um, Tanglin, and SAS, Singapore American School, typically do not support student visa applications, but there are other options. And again, it's not unusual for students or families to get into one school for a couple of years and then transfer. So I think finally, top tips to consider, um, consider what's important to, to your family and your children, both in terms of values, but also in terms of experiences and where they're gonna thrive best. Um, what activities um, matter to your students and what do you want want to expose them to. Of course, life after high school is kind of key to this. And if you have young children, this may seem like a long ways away, but it'll come quicker than, than you expect. But what country might they be applying to for college or university and which school best supports them in those aspirations? You will find um, schools will, will publish something called the school profile, which says, uh, gives a lot of information about the school, but one key thing is says, where do our students go after high school? Do they typically go to American institutions or British institutions or Canada, Australia, or staying within Asia? So that's important to consider. I mentioned about travel time, especially with young children um, and how far they have to commute every day. And the uniqueness of schools. Um, I've been to, I think, about 35 um, of the schools in Singapore, which when I was there was kind of all of them. There's been um, a huge um, increase in the number of schools, but they're all very different. They all feel very different. Um, and I think arranging visits is, a, is, a, is really key. And that's something that we help families with as well. So it's really about finding the best fit and there's no one best, no one, no school that's that's best for everyone. Um, it's really about thinking about your child, your family and, and which school will serve them best. And I think that's it. Um, I'm very um, open to any questions that people, people have. Yeah, thank you very much, Trevor. Very informative. And as you can see from that final slide, everyone, if you do want to get in touch with either myself or Trevor, it's best to go through Tess Wilkinson, who's one of the directors of education at Henley and Partners Education. And her email address is there and her mobile number. She's also on LinkedIn and Facebook, as well as WhatsApp. The key question for me, I suppose, Trevor, is you've basically given everyone a roadmap to success there in your presentation, which is wonderful. So what's the big benefit, would you say, in working with an individual like yourself, given that it's so competitive? What would you say is the, the real 
competitive benefit in working with an individual like yourself when it comes to getting into the right school and preparing well? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things there, John. Number one, it's I think families would have to sort of upskill or up knowledge um, about schools a lot. And after 13 years living in Singapore, fortunately, um, I know a lot about the schools and the culture of the feel. And I think in understanding kind of a family um, and their values and what they want, I could help make that sort of match the best. I think the other aspect is just kind of the, the hand-holding aspect in terms of contacting schools and trying to understand the processes um, can take a lot of time. Um, it's almost a full-time job for a family to sort of research and figure out which schools are, are best. Um, and I think finally, um, you know, there's no guarantees, of course, but in terms of ensuring that things are done correctly, to maximize a family's chance of admission to schools without any kind of unexpected delays for inaccurate or, or wrong or missing documents. Yeah, great, Thank, thanks Trevor. And in terms of, you talked about outcomes yeah. and the different types of curriculum, is there a typical destination or set of destinations for pupils coming out of Singaporean schools, or does it very much depend on the nature of the school, the nationality of the students? What, what's the typical trajectory of international students coming out of Singapore? Yeah, I mean, the countries, um, the kind of top three or top four countries remain um, consistent. So the in no particular, the U.S., the U.K., and Canada um, are the big sort of three. Um, for Singaporeans, Australia is also um, a big draw for them. But one growing shift that we've seen in the last, I don't know, five or six years, is there's much more interest in Canada um, and the U.K. is growing as well. Can, compared to the US, which the US interest has dropped a little bit. And I think that's both because of cost. So university in the US at kind of a selective university for tuition room and board will be, you know, 70,000 US dollars or more per year. Um, I think the other thing that's detracting families a little bit from the US is kind of the safety and, you know, the Asian hate in the media. The thing that's drawing families to places like Canada and the UK, it's a little bit easier to immigrate. If families are looking at eventually getting citizenship or their kids are, the US wants families to, kids to go there, study and leave. So they can stay for a year or up to three years to work after graduation. But after that, they, they want um, students to leave. Whereas like in Canada, um, you finish university and you automatically get a three-year work visa so i mean those types of, of, of factors as well as something can help with in terms of understanding future goals and advising about what may be the best pathway to to maximize um, those sort of aspirations or dreams and, and trevor just finally what additional services do you offer in terms of trips, for example, to the US and to Canada? You've clearly talked about your um, expertise in terms of choosing Singaporean schools, but you've also got additional services that you can offer through Henley and Partners Education that allow families to go on a journey with you. Yeah. So we also um, offer um, trips or programs for students or families to visit universities or colleges before applying. So just like in choosing a, a school, it's important when students are choosing potential university destinations that they make sure they make that right, that that best fit. And the best way to do that, of course, is by visiting. So we offer programs for families where we can customize uh, usually about a week long or 10 day tour of different colleges. So families say we want to visit these colleges during these dates um, and we customize a program and one of our staff members usually accompanies the family 
um, to take care of all logistics. And we do the same thing for sort of groups of families as well. So if there were three or four families or 10 families that all want to visit colleges during the same time, we can organize programs for them. Great, thanks Trevor. So with no more questions, that was incredibly thorough, very insightful and a wonderful skip through what's on offer in Singapore in terms of high quality education. Thank you so much, Trevor, for your time and for your insights. Just a reminder to everyone that is attending, you will be receiving a copy of this recording. And if you do have any questions, please do direct them to Tess Wilkinson at henleyglobal.com. We do have some more webinars coming up in the next week, particularly next Monday, we have a webinar on SEND or special educational needs. So if you do have children where they're maybe struggling either with their behavior or with their maths or their English or any form of educational need, then do tune in on Monday to be part of that SEND webinar. But otherwise, thank you so much, Trevor, for your time. It's been a pleasure. And I'm sure that our clients will thoroughly enjoy working with you and your team and look forward to seeing you again very shortly. Thanks very thank much, John. Everyone. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone.